Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless reggie you were onto this so, so long ago um you liken this to kind of a digital gulag explain this is the way it works laura it's like if you have these vaccine passports they can support the same functionality as the china social credit system it surveils every aspect of a person and assigns a social credit score about how compliant you are. And if you com combine that with the central bank digital currency, where the federal government is deciding whether or not you can spend your money, then they can just take your money away. They can sever you from your credit cards, from your bank account, and even from your bill. They can even empty your bank account if, you, if they deem that you are non-compliant. And that is a digital gulag. So you're saying the framework for the digital passport allows government entities, in this case an international organization perhaps, to, to put anything in those little digital drawers. So in this case, it's the vaccine passport, but then other bits of information uh, about you and your life can also go in those other drawers that are there. Correct. So the vaccine passport or any uh, mandatory digital ID, even a digital driver's license, a smart health card, can combine the functionality of the China social credit system. I know it, people are going to say, oh, you guys are conspiracy theorists. This is great. But people people were getting on my case in April of 2020 when I, because the Germany was talking about the vaccine passports early in the pandemic. So I saw them like, this is, this is like the new normal. This is, oh, people were like, you were crazy. Here we are. Well, absolutely. Things that seemed crazy two years ago are becoming reality, the new abnormal now, as uh, Dr. Cariotti would say. But... It's well established that we are already being surveilled in terms of uh, what our internet search history is, what our internet spending history is, all of these things, and they get put together easily with the vaccine passport platform. And when you, when you do that, then you can have a social credit system that ranks you in terms of who you are, what you believe, and if you are counter-narrative, then you can end up getting your credit. And we, we saw this in Canada with the truckers, okay? That um, the truckers got their uh, credit cards cut off, their bank ac accounts cut off, and even those who donated to them. People have to realize this is already happening. That's right, it's already happened in Canada. And if they think there's an emergency emerging, any type, climate emergency, racial emergency, pandemic, then all sorts of threats can emerge, including disinformation. I want to read another part of this declaration from the G20. And it says, we acknowledge that affordable and high quality digital connectivity is essential for digital inclusion and digital transformation. While a resilient, safe and secure online environment is necessary to enhance confidence and trust, we acknowledge the importance to counter disinformation campaigns. What m might that include to counter disinformation and misinformation campaigns? What does that include, do you think? I think that disinformation would be anything uh, that is counter-narrative, whatever, whatever the current WHO requirements are. So, for example, um, Dr. Peter McCullough, who is, is the Dear most... Dear friend of the program. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's, a, he's a hero. And he is probably the most published cardiologist in the history of the world, came out with early treatment protocols and also has been saying that there's myocarditis and many problems. Which there is, all true. You know, with, with the vaccines, that has been ca um, categorized as disinformation. And now he is having his medical license possibly revoked. He's under disciplinary action. That's what they mean by controlling disinformation. I think that the combination of the vaccine passport and the central bank digital currency is could be the worst abrogation of human rights that we've seen. Trust us, said the government. We truly have your best interests at heart. All we want to do is help keep you safe. And we're headed toward a one world global government with one massive monstrous leader. This is the kingdom that Satan is pulling together as the final attempt to dethrone God. 
It describes this kingdom as having powers like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. And what we find here is this monster is none other than the final antichrist. Even now, John says there are many antichrists. This is the final one. He rises up out of the sea, out of the nations. He consolidates all world power. This is globalism, symbolized by ten horns, a number of completion, as is seven heads. He has the consolidated power and the consolidated authority. He is a blasphemer, but a powerful one. And the dragon is Satan. And the dragon gave the Antichrist in John's vision his power, his throne, and his great authority. William Pitt, a well-known name in English history, said this, necessity, i.e. public health, common good, is the plea of every infringement of human freedom. It is the argument of tyrants. Get people afraid and they'll do whatever you want. A fearful society will always comply. Panicking people will believe anything. But we're headed toward a time when there's a global satanic kingdom. It consolidates all kingdoms of the world. It is under the final monster antichrist designed by the devil himself and the entire world follows him, the entire world. Congress is one step closer to giving federal protection to same-sex marriage. In a key vote last night, the bill gained the support of enough senators to clear a filibuster. A final vote in the Senate is expected today. A bipartisan group of senators included an amendment protecting the rights of those who oppose gay marriage on religious grounds. Still, critics say the amendment doesn't do enough to protect religious freedom. Capitol Hill correspondent Matt Galka reports. The bill was amended by a bipartisan group of senators putting in more religious liberty protections. But some Republicans say that even with the amended bill, it's still lacking. The amended bill hopes to win over Senate Republicans seeking religious liberty protections. The changes were put in place by two Democrats, Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, along with three Republicans, North Carolina's Tom Tillis, Maine's Susan Collins, and Ohio's Rob Portman. I'm announcing today a change of heart um, on an issue that um, you know, a lot of people feel strongly about. It has to do with uh, gay couples' opportunity to marry. And during my career in the House and also the last couple of years here in the Senate, you know, I've taken a position against gay marriage, um, rooted in part in, in my faith, in my faith tradition, and uh, had a very personal experience, uh, which is my son came to Jane, my wife and I, um, told us that he was gay and that uh, it was not a choice and that, you know, he, that's just part of who he is and he'd been that way ever since he could remember. And that launched an interesting process for me, which was kind of rethinking my position, uh, you know, talking to my pastor and other religious leaders and uh, going through a, a process of, at the end, changing my position on the issue. Um, I, I now believe that People ought to have the right to get married. Matthew 10, 37 through 39. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. The five released a statement on the amendment's effect saying, quote, through bipartisan collaboration, we've crafted common sense language to confirm that this legislation fully respects and protects Americans' religious liberties and diverse beliefs, while leaving intact the core mission of the legislation to protect marriage equality. The revisions include a guarantee that religious nonprofits won't be forced to facilitate same-sex marriages. It also promises not to alter the tax-exempt status of organizations following their religious beliefs. Supporters said that the bill was needed in the wake of the Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade, after Justice Clarence Thomas floated the idea of revisiting multiple cases, including the legalization of same-sex marriage. Millions of Americans deserve equal justice under the law, and peace of mind knowing their right to marry the person they love is protected. Some critics felt the bill was unnecessary and singles out people whose religious beliefs teach traditional marriage. I think the bill needs to be amended. 
Religious liberty is a cornerstone of our democracy. It's explicitly protected by the United States Constitution, and we cannot allow it to be trampled on. Utah Senator Mike Lee has been pushing for more religious liberty protections through his own amendment. He called the latest bill change, quote, insufficient, and argues churches and charities would be subjected to endless litigation under the Respect for Marriage Act, something other critics of the bill have echoed. Senator Lee's amendment would actually accomplish something. It would actually restrain the federal government from taking adverse action against individuals and organizations that hold traditional views about marriage. The Senate voted 61-35 for the bill as it overcomes the filibuster. Twelve Republicans joined Democrats to advance it. Traditional family is under attack like no other time in history. God instituted marriage between one man and one woman, and it is very holy to him. Why is marriage between a man and a woman so sacred to God? Genesis 2, 23 and 24. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Ephesians 5, 31 through 33. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. By mystery, Paul means the hidden plan of God that has come to fulfillment in Christ Jesus, as we read in Ephesians 3.9. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Thus. The Apostle Paul's quotation about marriage from Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5.31 ties into the relationship between Christ and his church. Paul's meaning is profound. He interprets the original creation of the husband and wife union as itself modeled on Christ's forthcoming union with the church as his body, as we read in Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, marriage from the beginning of creation in Genesis 1 was created by God to be a reflection of and patterned after Christ's relation to the church. Thus, Paul's commands regarding the roles of husbands and wives do not merely reflect the culture of his day, but also the present. God's ideal for all marriages at all times as exemplified by the relationship between the Bride of Christ, the Church, and Christ Himself, the Son of God. The biblical concept of marriage is a oneness between two individuals that pictures the oneness of Christ with His Church. Satan is busy in these last days, destroying marriage in every way possible. He got a foothold when gay marriage was legalized, and now anything goes. Satan hates marriage, and in particular, he hates Christian marriages because believers display the gospel and glorify God in their marriage. Satan aims to destroy Christian marriages because such opposition hinders the witness of Christ to the world. 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We turn now to Israel, where government officials are objecting to the FBI reopening an investigation into the tragic death of a Palestinian-American reporter several months ago in Israel. As Chris Mitchell now reports from Jerusalem, the FBI's move is creating tension between Israel and the United States. On May 11th, Al Jazeera reporter Shireen Abu Akleh died from a crossfire between Israeli troops and Palestinians in the city of Jenin. While well, the Palestinian Authority blamed the IDF for deliberately killing Akhle, it refused the offer of a joint investigation or produced the bullet that killed her. In September, the IDF finished its investigation, concluding it was likely accidental gunfire from the IDF that killed Abu Akhle. The U.S. State Department initially welcomed the findings, although now the FBI is reopening the case 
into the death of this dual Palestinian-American citizen. Israel's outgoing Prime Minister, Yair Lapid, slammed the decision. The IDF is a moral and ethical army. Those soldiers and commanders of the IDF protect Israel, thoroughly investigating any out-of-the-ordinary event, and are dedicated to the values and rules of democracy. The IDF soldiers will not be investigated by the FBI, nor by any foreign entity or foreign country, however friendly it may be. We will not abandon IDF soldiers to foreign investigators investigations, and our fierce protest was delivered to the Americans in the appropriate ranks. Israel's defense minister, Benny Gantz, calls the Justice Department decision a mistake, adding that we will not cooperate with any external investigation and we will not allow interference in Israel's internal affairs. Twenty Senate Democrats signed a letter asking the FBI to get involved. The report also sparked a response from Senator Ted Cruz, who issued a statement calling the alleged investigation an outrage and said that everyone involved, including Attorney General Merrick Garland, should be fired or impeached. Israeli commentator Ruthie Bloom believes domestic politics in Washington is behind the renewed investigation. The Democrats uh, have, been, have been targeting Israel throughout this whole, the whole Biden administration and they have been singling out Israel for censure about everything they can, unfairly. And first of all, the fact that they put pressure on the FBI does not mean that the FBI has to accept it. They don't run the FBI, but it's symbolic. CBN News reached out to the FBI for a comment, but have not yet received a response. Bloom feels the move is meant to put Israel in a bad light. I don't even think that something is going to come of this. But the damage it does to Israel's reputation and the regurgitating of a case whose only point from the Palestinian side was to blacken Israel's name and yet again accuse Israel of murdering innocent Palestinians is that was that was the point of it. That was the only point. The FBI investigation comes at a time of strained relations between the two allies, just as Benjamin Netanyahu is forming a coalition government. It has already seen interference from the Biden administration, and this incident could potentially make things worse. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's foreign policy is pretty simple. If you bless Israel, you will be blessed. If you curse Israel, you will be cursed. In the last days, Jerusalem will be the focal point of world politics as we read in Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Scripture plainly tells us all nations, including America, will be gathered against Jerusalem in the last days. The United States government will one day turn on Israel and bring the wrath of God upon this nation. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Across China, citizens and police clashing in the streets. Law enforcement racing to contain remarkable shows of opposition to China's President Xi Jinping. Some in Beijing openly calling for him to step down. This woman saying we should end his dictatorship and Xi only cares about himself. Frustrations with China's super strict zero COVID policy prompting thousands to protest Xi and his Communist Party while demanding freedom and denouncing censorship. The zero COVID policy um, has been a disaster, um, both economically uh, and politically inside China. Asian financial markets were down in early trading on news of the rare China protest and supply chain concerns. At Foxconn's largest iPhone plant, police in hazmat suits seen coming to blows with protesters last week, 
Following reports of workers upset by delays in bonus payouts and the company's handling of a COVID outbreak. Apple already reporting delays for some iPhone models. The demonstrations ramping up after 10 people died in a fire at an apartment complex in the western city of Urumqi. Residents blaming China's COVID measures for hindering rescue efforts, claiming it took fire crews three hours to knock out flames, which officials deny. The world now watching to see how President Xi responds. It is unimaginable that they will try to resolve the issue by backing down, uh, changing the policy. Um, it is not the Xi Jinping style. In April of this year, the Chinese government shut down Shanghai. Shanghai is the largest city in China. It's one of the biggest cities in the world. Shanghai has a population three times that of New York City, 25 million people. And all of those people, all 25 million, are now suffering indefinite lockdown. Shanghai is the largest prison camp in human history. In China, as in the United States, COVID policy is not a public health matter. COVID policy is a tool of social control. COVID policy is a way for the people in charge to strip from their population the most basic civil liberties and remain in charge. Well, here's what it looks like in China. In Lanzo City, some were forced to quarantine outside in the cold in parking lots. This viral video, which CNN could not verify, shows others forced to stay in male bathrooms, sleeping under urinals. And this one, the video says it's a quarantine site for kids in Henan province. A little boy jumping on bricks to avoid the pool of dirty liquid. This is where they use the bathroom. This woman sobs on the ground, crying that after she was caught with her mask pulled down, the government suspended her business for 30 days, losing a month's income. Metal spikes, which the man filming says were installed on a compound gate to prevent residents from leaving. So those are ad hoc COVID concentration camps, but there are new purpose-built COVID concentration camps under construction right now all throughout China. The city of Urumqi in the west of China has effectively been its own concentration camp for the last three months. It's been completely locked down. Residents have been unable to leave their homes for any reason, including to get food or medicine. So you have to ask, since China is the biggest country in the world, our main rival, largest economy, what does the Biden administration think of this? We must have a position on it. We have a State Department that exists to think up positions on things like this. So what does the Biden administration think of what's happening in China? Well, apparently they agree with it. Today, a White House spokesman, John Kirby, the famous John Kirby, was asked for official reaction to the human rights protests raging today in China. And here's what he said. What is the president's reaction when he hears protesters in China chant freedom or Xi Jinping step down? The president's not going to speak for protesters uh, around the world. They're speaking for themselves. And so there's no reaction? This, the, the, these protesters are speaking for themselves. What we are doing is making it clear that we support the right of peaceful protest. The protesters are speaking for themselves. Haven't we spent $60 billion to prop up the corrupt government of Ukraine because they're on the side of freedom and democracy, even though it's not a free or democratic country? But that's the pretext. We're for freedom. But here you have people saying, hey, I don't want to be thrown in a concentration camp or starve to death in my own apartment, and the Biden administration can't even take their side? Really? They speak for themselves? They don't speak for the U.S. government? The U.S. government doesn't stand for basic human rights anymore? Really? John Kirby? You should be ashamed of yourself. It's hard to believe that's real. It is real. And the U.S. Congress has, by and large, adopted the same posture. Nor did we hear a word from the NBA commissioner. That would be Adam Silver. Now, Adam Silver also spends a lot of time yelping about what an authoritarian country this is and threatening the people who live here with punishment. He has no problem threatening American voters in North Carolina, for example, or in Texas who wanted separate bathrooms for little girls. What does he think of killing people for wanting to leave their apartment? or throwing people en masse into concentration camps. Well, we decided to find out. So we emailed this office today to get his view of Chinese concentration camps. What does Adam Silver think of that? One of our premier moral voices. We didn't get a reply. Why is that? Maybe because he has made millions personally and the NBA itself makes billions of dollars in China. So the NBA has no word to say about China throwing its population into concentration camps, turning Shanghai into a prison. And in fact, when you ask NBA coaches about civil rights abuses in China, what you get is a lecture about how we're worse. Watch. Nor has uh, our record of um, human rights abuses come up either. People in China didn't ask me about uh, 
you know, people owning AR-15s and mowing each other down in a mall. I wasn't asked that question. Oh, so China commits genocide against Muslims and locks down a city of 25 million people, but we've got the Second Amendment and they're pretty much the same. That's the word from Steve Kerr, who's a very famous coach. These people are all on the take from China. The NBA is literally on the take from China. And therefore, they will not say a single negative word about their masters. This is not an American league. These are not people who are loyal to the United States. They despise the United States. They're on the payroll of China. That's true. So they can't even criticize children burning alive in a high-rise apartment building because the doors have been nailed shut because of COVID, which doesn't actually pose a threat to anybody. So the NBA is taking a pass. Eric Squalwell and his Chinese spy girlfriend are taking a pass. The White House is taking a pass. State Department, MSNBC taking a pass. So you have to ask, like, what about the basic ideas behind this? One of the most basic ideas in American life is that it's my body, my choice. We have bodily autonomy in this country. Bodily autonomy. And bodily autonomy is central to the abortion debate. You can't force me to carry my child to term because it's my body. I control my body, not the government. In case you haven't heard that argument before, here it is. This is from recently. Watch. The right to choose is on this ballot. We want to protect a woman's right to choose. Are you ready to stand up for a woman's right to choose? Remove all doubt that a woman has a right to choose. Protecting a woman's right to choose. I mean it sincerely about what's on the ballot this year. Your right to choose is on the ballot. Oh, the right to choose, right to choose abortion. What about the right to go outside or the right to choose whether to send your children to school or the right to choose what drugs go into your body or the right to choose not to be thrown into a concentration camp? Are those viable rights too? Are those also examples of bodily autonomy? Do the 1.5 billion people who live in China or the 340 million who live here, do they have bodily autonomy? No. They don't, according to those people. They don't care about bodily autonomy. They don't care about human rights. What they care about is controlling you forever. And that's true. Earth's largest active volcano is erupting on Hawaii for the first time in nearly four decades. The sky, as you see, glowed a bright orange color as hot lava spilled over Mauna Loa's summit. Now, scientists say this is not threatening any populated areas yet, but the volcanic ash cloud could make it harder for some people to breathe. Carter Evans has the latest on this eruption. New video shows fountains of lava spewing from Mauna Loa, forming rivers of molten rock flowing down the world's largest active volcano. Thermal imaging shows the moment it roared back to life, ending in nearly 40-year dormancy. Residents on Hawaii Island woke up to the fiery site Sunday night after a series of large earthquakes. And also the ground started swelling outward from the volcano. So you knew this was coming? We knew it was coming. We just didn't know that it was going to be in the middle of the night after Thanksgiving weekend. But any threats to the community could be weeks away. People will right. have plenty of time to evacuate if that's needed. Yes, that's absolutely true. The last time Bonaloa erupted was in 1984. Lava flowed within five miles of Hilo, the island's most populous town. The nearly 14,000-foot volcano is just miles from Kilauea. It's smaller but much more active, and it's been erupting for decades now. You can see it just launching lava up into the air. We were there in 2018 when massive lava flows wiped out hundreds of homes. That is a huge, huge lava front there. When it was over months later, the island was nearly 900 acres larger. For now, the only threat with this eruption is volcanic smog and ash, leaving residents with a front row seat to nature's beauty. Psalm 18.7, then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. There has been a dramatic increase in volcanic eruptions around the world and nobody knows why. You probably haven't noticed because nobody seems to be talking about it but something is going on with the world. Volcanoes are erupting at a faster pace than ever, and earthquakes are going crazy, and nobody has an explanation for it. Nobody except God, that is. The seven-year tribulation is fast approaching this world, and the news headlines prove it. God in his grace and mercy is trying to shake the world out of its complacency. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. Jesus is likening last day's events to a woman in labor. The closer we get to Jesus' second coming, Last day signs and calamities will become more frequent and more intense. 
Following the rapture of all true Christians to heaven, the Bible warns us that the wrath of God will be poured out on an unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation seems to include a massive volcanic eruption, as we read in Revelation 8.8. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. So let's start here with Thanksgiving leftovers now in, I don't know, full in the fridge, the holiday season now officially in full swing. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas as trees start to light up around the world, including our own veranda. You can catch your favorite carol maybe on the radio station or maybe you're on a full-time Christmas radio station or your favorite movie on a movie channel where it reminds you of Christmas growing up. From baking, decorating to uh, gift giving, it finally feels like things are back to normal this holiday season. No one's saying the word pandemic. But some of these age-old traditions that unify us and bring us back, bring us those fond memories of family and friends together, well, we were forced to change our lives because of COVID just a few years ago. Are we going to go back to those lives? Will people go back to doing the things they normally do in the holiday season starting, I don't know, now? Let's talk about those traditions. What has changed forever? I don't know what your answer is. So we sent Joey to the streets to find out how people plan on celebrating not only the Thanksgiving celebration, but the Christmas and holiday celebration. Watch. Are you going to do the same thing this year as you did in 2018? Are you going to have the same amount of people? Or do you have less? Do you take more precautions? You know, I feel like that now that the pandemic is kind of like subsided, I think it'll go back to normal. Probably have the same amount of people as I did prior pandemic. You know, everyone's being safe about it. This year, there's a lot of people coming back. It's like, I feel like we're slowly getting back into that like meeting again. So this year is going to be good. It finally feels like things are back to normal this holiday season. Will people go back to doing the things they normally do in the holiday season? starting, I don't know, now? You know, I feel like that now that the pandemic has kind of like subsided, I think it'll go back to normal. I feel like we're slowly getting back into that like meeting again, so this year is going to be good. We are now living in a time when society thinks things are getting back to normal. Jesus tells us that during a time of so-called normality that he would return. Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus tells us in verse 37, when our days parallel the days of Noah, he is returning. Jesus goes on to tell us in verses 38 and 39 that when he returns, things will be going on as normal, as people will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Just as in the days of Noah, when people were caught off guard and the flood came, so also will people of our time be caught off guard when Jesus returns. I believe that time has arrived. Luke 17, 26 through 30. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Just in the days of Noah, when God sent a flood, and in the days of Lot, when God sent fire and brimstone to judge mankind, he is about to send his final judgments on a wicked and unrepentant world. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. When the fifth seal is broken, those who have been slain for the word of God 
and their testimony will be given white robes and told to rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. When the sixth seal is broken, there will be a great earthquake. The sun will become black as sackcloth of hair and the moon like blood and the stars of heaven will fall to the earth. When the seventh seal is broken, there will be silence in heaven for about a half an hour. After seven seals are opened, seven trumpets are blown. When the first angel sounds, vegetation is struck. Hail and fire mingled with blood will be thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees and all the green grass will be burned up. When the second angel sounds, the seas are struck. Something like a great mountain burning with fire is thrown into the sea, which seems to be a meteor causing a third of the sea to become blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea to die, and a third of the ships to be destroyed. When the third angel sounds, the waters are struck. A great star falls from heaven, burning like a torch on the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood, and a third of the waters become Wormwood, and many men will die from the water, because it will be made poisonous. When the fourth angel sounds, the heavens are struck. A third of the sun is struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them are darkened. A third of the day will not shine, and likewise the night. When the fifth angel sounds, Satan is cast down from heaven to release demons from the bottomless pit to torment those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads for five months. When the sixth angel sounds, a demonic army numbering 200 million will kill a third of mankind. Four billion people have now died at this time, equaling half of the world's population. When the seventh angel sounds, the temple of God is opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant is seen in his temple, and there are lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. After seven trumpets have sounded, seven bowls are poured out. When the first angel pours out his bowl, a foul and loathsome sore will come upon the men who have the mark of the beast, and those who worship his image. When the second angel pours out his bowl on the sea, it will become blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea will die. When the third angel pours out his bowl, the rivers and springs of water will become blood. When the fourth angel pours out his bowl on the sun, power is given to him to scorch men with fire and men are scorched with great heat. When the fifth angel pours out his bowl on the throne of the beast, his kingdom becomes full of darkness, and they will gnaw their tongues because of the pain. When the sixth angel pours out his bowl, it results in the Euphrates River being dried up, and the armies of the Antichrist being gathered together to wage the battle of Armageddon. When the seventh angel pours out his bowl, a loud voice comes out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. A devastating earthquake flattening everything on planet Earth followed by giant hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, completes the seal, trumpet, and bold judgments. God's judgment against this wicked and unrepentant world will leave no doubt as to his wrath against sin. Yet there will still be people blaspheming God and not repenting and giving him glory. Revelation 16.9 And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Revelation 16.21 and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance 
is not a work that earns salvation. Repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.